Many questions still unanswered after a Smith-Jackson email from Thanksgiving break. Elon Local News investigated to find out more about the incident that has students talking on campus. And later in the show... Something like this, it kind of you know, kind of wakes you up and stuff. I was always a responsible drinker, but I think it was kind of just, it just soured me to alcohol. We talked to the brother of one UNC student who is remembering his brother after his death less than two months ago. Bombs everywhere, fire, people running around, like chickens with their heads cut off. The holidays are only weeks away, but the end of the world might be too. We'll have more on what some people think about the Mayans rumor. I'm Brian Mazursky. And I'm Scarlett Fakar. The last show of the semester starts right now. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A Smith-Jackson email that still has students talking and tonight we continue our coverage. Students came back to campus after Thanksgiving break with an email in their inbox about a potentially dangerous situation. Elon Local News has been investigating the case. Joe Bruno joins us live in the studio with more. Joe. Brian, as we all know, Elon's students were on their way back to school when they received an email from Smith-Jackson saying campus police stopped an armed 18-year-old girl named Alexis Gray. ELN immediately confirmed that Gray was taken to a hospital for evaluation, but the university will not release any other information to us about Gray's whereabouts. ELN investigated and were able to obtain the full name of Gray's ex-boyfriend. Here's how we found out. I was calling you back about the recording that you requested. Um, I checked with Doug Dotson. The chief Franks is not in the ELN office today, ELN University office today. But um, he said that it's under investigation. He's going to review some things, and he's going to let me know if I can release it to you. That appears to violate North Carolina open record laws. We took a trip to Alamance Communications to tell them. After some discussion, they released a modified version of the 911 dispatch. Okay, yeah, I'll need that address if you can get it for me, please. They want Greg's address. The 911 call includes Greg's name. They want Greg's address. After hearing the name on the 911 call, ELN did some more investigation. We reviewed public tweets and photos and talked to his friends. We are able to report that the ex-boyfriend of Alexis Gray is Greg Seelagy. ELN called Greg for a comment. He hung up on us. Our emails to him went unanswered, so I went to his apartment, but he wasn't home. We have found out some information about Seelagy and his ex-girlfriend. Gray's tweets claim that she dated Greg up to as recently as November 1st. According to Facebook, as of November 19th, Greg has been in a new relationship. But the story is even more complicated. Greg Seelagy was arrested this past summer and has charges pertaining to a road rage incident. Court records state that he pointed a handgun at another driver on I-95 in Lower Makefield, Pennsylvania. The police investigation revealed that he had an airsoft handgun, which was found inside a trash can at a Barnes & Noble in Falls Township, PA. Seelagy is due in court on January 10th. Now for what's next, we have been in constant communication with the Elon Campus Police Chief, Dennis Franks. I met with Franks and he would not give us an incident report. He said the incident is still under investigation. Elon is continuing to investigate. Continue to check our website for updates on this case. Thanks, Joe. According to the Smith-Jackson email, Gray's parents alerted campus police after learning of their daughter's intentions. Our Alex Rose spoke with campus police to learn more about how they prepare to handle situations such as this one. Every year, the cops you see around campus go through training. While every officer on the campus squad is certified by the state of North Carolina, they know protecting a campus is a little different than the typical police work. Campus police officer Vicki Molman says that dealing with students is different because every year the campus welcomes new faces. It's a different type of police, police work because your, your clients change. Elon Police Chief Dennis Franks wants more training. You can always do more and uh, we look at uh, outside training vendors that can come in and do training. As a matter of fact, uh, over the uh, uh, Christmas break, we have a group coming in to do training, a 20-hour training block for our security staff. The 24-hour training is divided into three parts. 12 hours of policing topics assigned by the state of North Carolina. This could range anywhere between traffic interdiction to surviving use of force incidents. 
four hours of firearms training, and eight hours of topics the department can choose. Over the past couple years, they've been familiarizing themselves with a close friend to the college student, social media. Use it as crime prevention. Um, you can use it as a way to get information out that students need to know right away. Officers agree that having annual training in the summers keeps their skills sharp in case they have to react to a dangerous situation. You know, we train uh, together on, on things with the town of Elon police. Uh, we work well together with them. We just remain vigilant and continue to be out to do what our job is and to be visible. And a lot, most of the times that will deter incidents from occurring. Alex Rose, Elon, Local News. You can keep up with Campus Police by liking their Facebook page, Elon University Campus Safety and Police, or follow them on Twitter at Elon U Police. Another issue brought to light from this situation, the use of guns in the state of North Carolina. Smith Jackson's email said Campus Police found a rifle and other weapons in Alexis Gray's car. Our Eric Halpern found out what it takes to own and operate a gun in North Carolina. The Second Amendment gives the right to own a gun, and North Carolina creates the restrictions. But Caliber's shooting range's Manny Matos says there isn't a lot standing between an American citizen and a firearm. In this state, uh, 18 and above, you are allowed to purchase a rifle, 21 and above, to buy a handgun. Matos stressed that as long as an individual is over 18 and does not have a criminal history, they can go to any store and purchase a gun. But just because someone can buy a gun doesn't mean they know how to use it properly. Totally. It, 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 you'll have to have some form of training. And even if you purchase a rifle right on a, a store, the fact that a person can show you without having to fire that rifle several times, that don't mean that you will be able to get it immediately. So I decided to give it a try. I watched the safety video and took a lesson. You need to know that now you need to close the chamber and chamber only one round. That would chamber around for you, but it still won't fire. Now you need to know the safety have to come off. Then it was off to the range, but Manny was right. One training session was not enough to master shooting a gun. Over and over, maybe three or four times, and I let you go ahead and do it. You're not going to remember. That's just going to take a repetition. Eric Halperin, Elon Local News. Thanks, Eric. Coming up on Elon Local News. The death of a UNC Chapel Hill student hits home for one Elon student. More on his story coming up. And while students here at Elon also are preparing for finals, some people are getting a look at uh, ancient mind prophecy. That story and more after the break. Through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. For students who are heading home for the holidays and may be revisiting past flames, you may want to keep an eye out for signs of a potentially violent relationship. Our Brenna McDavid looked into some signs that could predict an unhealthy relationship. It started off really fine and every, it was a good relationship. And then I think he just became kind of possessive. Senior Chrissy Passowitz found herself in a verbally abusive relationship. And like many people, she didn't know it. You don't realize that He's kind of changing who you are. Elon's coordinator for violence prevention, Becca Bishoprick, told ELN what defines a violent relationship. Abuse or violence um, can happen in such a wide range of, of ways. It can be physical, it can be sexual, it could be verbal, it could be emotional or social. A recent survey by loveisnotabuse.com found that 43% of women who are dating were in dangerous relationships. And for that reason, Bishop Prick thinks students should be more educated about the signs of violent relationships. According to Bishop Prick, some signs of a physically abusive relationship include pushing or throwing a cell phone against the wall. A sexually abusive relationship might involve someone being manipulated or pressured into sex. One example of emotional abuse is telling your partner that he or she is not good enough. And social abuse can involve your significant other isolating you from family and friends. Elon has several options for those who are in a violent relationship or might know somebody in a violent relationship. Those include counseling services or contacting campus security. Passowitz recognized the signs and called on campus security for help. She has some advice for other people in similar situations. I would say it first stems with you having confidence in yourself and knowing that you deserve something better. 
Brennan McDavid, Elon, Local News. If you need immediate support but don't want to go to campus security, you can call the Discrimination and Harassment Hotline. That number is 336-278-3333. Student deaths affect more than just their campus. The death of a UNC Chapel Hill freshman is now being linked to alcohol, leaving friends and family devastated. Our David's older brother Stephen is a senior at Elon, and he was the first in his family to hear about his little brother's death early in the morning on October 28th, one day after David fell to his death at the Ready Mixed Concrete Plant in Carborough. Uh, a lot of people from Charlotte, my high school, go there, so you know David was well known in just two two and a half months of school, so you know everyone knew David already. David was pledging the Chi Phi fraternity at UNC. Even a month after his death, his Facebook page is filled with comments of love and support. Students and families from both schools have reached out to the Shannon family, including Stephen personally. Family friends have already started three scholarship funds in David's name. It, it meant a lot to my family and stuff, um, you know, to try to make something good out of something so horrible. And this is one way to do it, you know, help like raise scholarship money for people who want to go to college because UNC was a, it was a big deal for my brother. He wanted to go to UNC from a young age because my mom and grandpa went there. And so Police believe that David's death was accidental, but that alcohol was involved. And Stephen says his opinion on drinking has changed. Something like this, it kind of, you know, kind of wakes you up and stuff. I was always a responsible drinker, but I think it was kind of just, it just soured me to alcohol. Stephen says there are many things to be learned from his brother's death. Be safe, um, be responsible, but also, you know, tell your parents you love them, hug your brothers and sisters and stuff, and just because you, you don't know how long you're going to be on this earth like it's super cheesy to say but I was I was texting him like you know the night before it happens and then I texted him again on Saturday no response you know so you, you don't know what's going to happen like you never think this is going to happen to you but but then it does I've, I've had people reach out to me. Uh, thank you Carly that was Carly Harley reporting and Steven says he doesn't have a problem with friends drinking and doesn't expect them to stop but he hopes it will at least cause students to rethink their drinking habits. Stephen was unavailable for an interview until recently, and he spoke most of the weeks following his brother's death at home in Charlotte. Finals are right around the corner, and many students are feeling the stress. Some students are getting sick, but if you need medical attention, you may want to consider skipping a trip to the emergency room. The average wait time in the ER at Alamance Regional Medical Center is around 8 to 12 hours. While the facility is not overloaded with patients, the clinic has been slow processing people in the waiting room. Although the wait time is long, Alamance Regional Medical Center will treat a patient immediately if there is a serious illness or injury. Renovations coming to the Haggard Square apartment complex and starting next spring, the complex will only be leased to Elon students, leaving some current residents without a home. Home. Drive a few blocks down Haggard Avenue and you'll find Haggard Square Apartments, home to many Elon residents. But you may notice some changes coming to the apartments. Two Elon alumni are taking over the complex and leasing the newly named Oasis to Elon students beginning June 1st. Manager and overseer of these renovations, Dave Stoughton, said that these apartments will be cleaned up and ready for students to live in. I hope that people now that would see the complex would uh, agree that the landscaping is uh, beautiful and unique and that the setting itself provides for a very different environment than what you're going to find anywhere else at Elon. But while these new apartments may accommodate more students, it's forcing the current Burlington residents to move, leaving residents like Martha Mobley upset. It is going to be really hard to find a new place to live that I can afford. These residents will have to leave the complex by March 31st. The only option that the new landlords are offering is another complex they own in Gibsonville. But Mobley says this isn't the best financial option for her. They're in Guilford County. They're not going to furnish water. The rent's going to be $25 more a month than what I'm paying now. And then I will probably have to pay a $30 to $40 water bill. This causes a problem for residents with children who will have to switch schools and for those who cannot afford the extra fees from the Gibsonville apartments. Stoughton says that these residents have known for a year that their leases were not going to be renewed. And with new management brings new changes. 
But residents like Martha Mobley say they have only known for a few months. Everything was the same until a few months ago when they decided that they were going to turn this complex into student housing. And I was going to have to vacate my apartment. Chris Apparent, Elon. Like a nuclear Coming up bomb. after the break. Starts with a huge white light. While some are preparing for the holidays, others are getting ready for an ancient Mayan prediction to come true. Coming up next, you've seen construction on campus all semester. We finally got a sneak peek inside the new Lakeside Dining Hall. Lakeside Dining Hall is almost ready to open, and our Gary Grumbach got an exclusive tour of the new facility. He's live from Mosley to tell us more. Gary, what can you tell us? I'm standing in Mosley Center, right near the mail room. This is going to be one of the four entrances to the new Lakeside Dining Hall. I went on a tour of the facility and got the exclusive Lakeside Lowdown. Construction workers are busy putting the finishing touches on the new Lakeside Dining Hall and Winter Garden Cafe. The facility will open at the beginning of the spring semester. Elon Dining's marketing manager, Kate Nelson, gave Elon Local News a sneak peek of the facility. Lakeside Dining Hall will be Elon's largest, with multiple food stations and a variety of food court and fast food style options all in one place. Colonnade's Dining Hall is 24,000 square feet and Lakeside Dining Hall is 38,000 square feet. Lakeside Dining Hall will feature a ballroom on its second level with a balcony overlooking the dining hall. The dining hall will have three main stations. It will have one station that's kind of globally inspired where our executive chef Pinky Vergasi has developed some global menus. So each week we'll visit a new country and or region with authentic dishes. Um, there's going to be a locally inspired station. So based on seasonality and availability, there'll be some local options. So for example, if sweet potatoes are in season, then we'll have entrees featuring sweet potatoes. And then there's a home station, which is similar to Isabella's, where you'll get your meat, potatoes, vegetables, items like that. And for students who are worried about old favorites like Topio's, Grillworks, and Pangeo's leaving, Nelson says Elon Dining is trying to accommodate these concerns. Um, right now, Pangeo's is scheduled to close. Um, that did not make it into the new building, but we are looking into options to have those menu items offered in other places on campus, so the taco salad will not be going away. <laughs> for more updates on the construction, Visit Elon Dining Services' Facebook page or their Twitter account, at Elon Dining. Lakeside Dining Hall hours have yet to be determined, but Kate Nelson says that other dining hall hours will not be affected. Reporting live from Mosley Center, Gary Grumbach, Elon Local News. Thank you, Gary. New facilities are coming to Elon, but old traditions continue, like luminaries. Campus got a little brighter on Thursday night as 1,500 luminaries lit the campus's sidewalks. The Elon community enjoyed hot chocolate, apple cider, and some holiday music. Elon's own sweet signatures and other student carolers performed for the students and faculty. Even President Lambert made an appearance. And of course, Santa and Mrs. Claus were there too. SGA member Sarah Pigenza spent the day setting up for the event. She says this Elon tradition holds a special place in her heart. thankful and, and enjoy each other before we all leave. Tis the season for giving and some students are spreading the holiday cheer overseas. Elon's Alpha Omicron Pi and ROTC teamed up to make boxes for troops overseas at their annual Sisters for Soldiers event. More than 70 boxes were packaged, each filled with basics and handwritten notes. That's double the amount of boxes from last year's event. Some ROTC members were auctioned off as dates to raise money for sending the boxes. Members of the ROTC agree that it's events like this that make a difference. I can't imagine, you know, fighting and being in the middle of nowhere and just having to spend Christmas, you know, without anything. So, like, this is just an awesome opportunity. And this holiday season isn't about cheer for some. A prediction from the Mayan civilization has some people thinking the world is about to end. I spoke with a professor who studies the ancient culture to learn more. The end of the semester is here, and while students are stuck studying in the library, many are wishing for an excuse to relieve them from the stress of finals, potentially the end of the world. 
it's gonna blow up and everyone's gonna die. Bombs everywhere, fire, people running around, like chickens with their heads cut off. It's like a nuclear bomb. It starts with a huge white light. Although students jokingly describe how they think the world will end, December 21st, 2012 is quickly approaching. That's the day when the ancient Mayan calendar is predicted to end, marking the total destruction of the world. I'm preparing for anarchy following economic collapse. To some, it may sound like fantasy, but TV shows and the internet have helped to spark the craze about the world's end. But all this talk, sociology and anthropology professor Risa Trackman says is nothing more than a rumor. I don't believe the world's going to end, no, not at all. I think we're all going to be here for winter term. Trackman has worked hands-on in Belize since 1997, home to the ancient Mayan culture. She says people think the calendar will end on December 21st, but really, a new calendar cycle begins the next day. Trackman says taking the Mayan concept of time out of context is the reason for all the doomsday confusion. The Maya really saw endings as beginnings. Which means, according to the Mayans, the world probably won't end this month. So students still should find a way to survive final exams. Professor Trackman says this doomsday time can be used to talk about the current treatment of our environment. She says there are always ways to improve sustainable practices because she says some natural disasters could be prevented. Coming up in sports, we'll bring you the highlights from this weekend when Elon took on College of Charleston in basketball. <laughs> After a 5-2 start to the season and an opening victory in the conference, Elon's men's basketball team was looking to move to 2-0 in SoCon play on Saturday against College of Charleston. Like last year's double overtime thriller, this one would come down to the wire. Elon got off to a very good start in the first half, pushing to an early 14-6 lead on Austin Hamilton's three-point jump shot, but College of Charleston would keep the half close with Nori Johnson sinking this three ball. Elon's best player of the day was junior Riley Beaumont, who finished with 14 points and seven boards. Fellow big man Lucas Troutman had a nice game as well, collecting 12 points on the night and one monster dunk. Speaking of monster dunks, here's Charleston's Adai Baru slamming it down with a huge dunk. Charleston would see their lead move to nine points with just six and a half minutes remaining, but Elon would fight back with an impressive effort in the last few minutes. Here, Jack Eisenbarger cuts the lead to six. With just one minute remaining now, another Baru slam would give Charleston a three-point lead. And with only 25 seconds remaining, Lucas Troutman comes up huge with a bucket. After Charleston only hit one of two free throws, Elon would have one more chance, but the inbound pass is a bad one, and Austin Hamilton can only put up a prayer from half court that doesn't fall, handing Elon a tough loss at home. I talked with Elon's head coach Matt Matheny after the game on his thoughts after the disappointing result. And uh, I love the, the way our kids fought to hang in there. Um, it, we were ready. Our, guy, our kids competed um, from the start. And uh, we got in foul trouble, and um, we didn't manage the end of the half very well. Uh, credit Charleston. They really defended us in the first half. Uh, we didn't get a lot of good, clean looks. Uh, they made it difficult not only for Lucas but for everybody. I mean, we shot 26%, and that's not all missed shots. What that is is good defense by them. Thanks, Jamie, for all that sports news. You've seen it on commercial breaks, and now we've fought back tears all day, Scarlett. It's time to honor you. We've had a great semester working with you. All of us has enjoyed the time together reporting for us. We do appreciate all the work you've done for us, and we wish you the best as you go off to Texas. It really was a great, great semester to be with you. Thank you guys so much, and I can't wait to watch that tribute. Um, I'm definitely going to miss all of you very much, but um, be sure to stay tuned on Elon Local News. I'm really going to miss you guys, so that's all we have for tonight's broadcast. Have a great holidays, everyone.